Good evening, everyone. My name is Jane Pickering. I'm the Executive Director of the Harvard Museums of Science and Culture, and that includes the Harvard Museum of Natural History, which is the sponsor for tonight's event. Um, and this is actually the final installment of our Evolution Matters lecture series. And so we've had three wonderful lectures, uh, all on the topic, um, exploring the various aspects of evolution through natural selection. And this is our final talk with Steve Stearns from Yale, and I think it's going to be just as marvelous as the others, so I'm very excited. We do have a complete list of our spring programs online for the whole of HMSC, and I would encourage you to also pick up a few of our um, brochures and things that are to my right on the table. And you can also join our email list and so get regular updates for all the programs going on here. And you can also find out how to become a member and help support all the wonderful programs that we do. And I would like to acknowledge, although I haven't actually seen them here yet, Drs. Herman and Joan Suit. Um, since no one's standing up and waving, I assume they weren't able to be here. Um, but Herman and Joan have very generously supported the Evolution Matters lecture series for a number of years now. We couldn't do it without them. And so I'd actually like to acknowledge them in their absence, if that's okay with everybody. <laughs> And thanks to their support, tonight's talk is being videoed and will be posted along with the other Evolution Matters lectures on our website. And finally, I'd like to just mention that we have another lecture on Tuesday, April the 29th, um, supported by the Peabody Museum, which is called Between the Caves, Landscape Archaeology of the Paleolithic in the French Central Pyrenees, so we can all come and look at wonderful photographs of the French Central Pyrenees and wish we were there. Um, anyhow, I am actually, once again, delighted to introduce a Harvard faculty member who will introduce at tonight's speaker, Peter Ellison. And Dr. Ellison is the John Cowles Professor of Anthropology and Human Evolutionary Biology here at Harvard in a position he has held since 2003. And he was also, for his sins, Dean of the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences from 2000 to 2005, and has taught here at Harvard since 1983. He is a member of the National Academy of Sciences and a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. And he currently serves on the Scientific Advisory Board for the National Evolutionary Synthesis Center, is the co-editor-in-chief of the Annual Review of Anthropology, and editor-in-chief <laughs> of the American Journal of Human Biology. And as with many Harvard professors, I could go on for a lot longer, but actually I'd like to bring him up um, to introduce our speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. It's a, it's a distinct pleasure to introduce Professor Stearns. Professor Stearns, I think of as uh, a force of nature in uh, evolutionary biology. Uh, he, he certainly has been a positive selective force, if I can say that, on the field for uh, his entire career. Um, he was, uh, he's currently the Edward Bass Professor of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at Yale, uh, but his career has been rather meteoric. He burst on the scene um, while still a postdoc, I believe, uh, after finishing his uh, uh, his degree at Reed? No, no. British, British Columbia. That, that's right. But then we're, was on the faculty at Reed. Yeah. Uh, early on. But uh, burst on the scene by publishing what was an extremely influential review in the Quarterly Review of Biology on uh, life history theory, which was a, an area of evolutionary ecology that was just burgeoning, uh, which then led on to uh, his very important uh, book, The Evolution of uh, Life Histories. He uh, left the U.S. for a, a period and ha was uh, the director of the Institute of Zoology and, and, and uh, professor of zoology at the University of Basel in Switzerland uh, for a number of years, uh, from 1983 to, to 2000. Um, and while there, he, he started the European Society for the Study of Evolution, for evolutionary biology. Uh, he edited the journal of that society for some time. 
uh, and he began the collection of what is a very distinguished uh, wine cellar. <laughs> he has received any number of accolades, including the Devane Medal for a distinction in undergraduate teaching. Uh, he, in addition to uh, the uh, book I mentioned on the evolution of life histories, he's published perhaps one of the most uh, widely used textbooks on evolution, Evolution and Introduction, uh, together with his co-author, Rolf Hoekstra. Uh, and uh, also uh, edited a very important uh, volume on uh, evolution in health and disease, uh, which, has, which was one of the major uh, starting points for what has become a rapidly growing field of, of evolutionary or Darwinian medicine. Uh, as uh, payment for his sins, he is now the editor of a new journal, uh, Evolution, Medicine, and Public Health, which is uh, perhaps the flagship of that uh, burgeoning field. He has served as the vice president for the Society for the Study of Evolution. He is a fellow of the American Asso Association for Advancement of Science, uh, and the accolades go on and on, but I won't take any more of your time. Instead, I will introduce Professor Stearns. Welcome in. Well, Jane, thank you for the invitation, and uh, Peter, thank you for the introduction, and uh, thank all of you who have come for coming. How many of you are from Framingham? <laughs> Not too many. Well, I had been hoping. <laughs> Um, about seven years ago, the chief geneticist in the Framingham Heart Study walked into my office in New Haven and said, uh, I know your work on evolution, and I've got my hands on all of this data from Framingham. I, you think we could do anything with it? And I looked at it, and I thought, well, if there was one thing that I would like to do with the human population, it would be to demonstrate that evolution is still going on. And that's not a point that would surprise any evolutionary biologist. But as early as 1869, an Irish doctor wrote a paper saying that, oh, this guy Darwin, well, okay, he's got some ideas, but we all know that evolution has stopped in humans because of modern medicine. Now, that's just not true, and in a minute we'll do a little exercise that will convince you of uh, why it hasn't stopped. So what I'm going to talk about today is uh, our measurement of a burst of selection in Framingham. Actually, for many of the traits, the people were experiencing selection, say, for those born between about 1900 and 1940. And then on traits like cholesterol and blood pressure, that went away for interesting reasons. Uh, it continued, however, for age at first birth, so the age at which women mature and have their first child. Now I'm going to talk a bit about intersexual constraints, evidence for cause of reproduction, and then I'm going to switch to a study that we did in the Gambia to show a few ideas on the impact of the demographic transition on human evolution and what it means for the degenerative diseases that we are now increasingly encountering, heart disease, cancer, diabetes, and things like that. So our aims first were to see whether natural selection is operating on contemporary humans. It is. So we have not been able to demonstrate a genetic response. Had we been able to, that would have been astonishing because we really only have one generation uh, of grandchildren in which we could have seen it. Then we also wanted to ask whether selection on males constrains responses in females and selection on females constrains responses in males. And we can show that it did. I'll explain why that happens. But it has the knock-on effect that you can always blame the other sex for whatever your problem is. <laughs> Since I started out in life history evolution, I'm quite interested in the cost of reproduction because they play a big role in the evolution of aging and in the evolutionary explanation of why it is that we must grow old and die. And I wanted to see if they exist in Framingham, and they do, and they are in part genetically based, and we have uh, some hints at the genes that might be involved. And then to place these results in the general context of the demographic transition, I'll take a look at the demographic transition in the Gambia. And this is a worldwide phenomenon that really changes selection pressures on humans. It's one of the biggest things that's happened to us in the last uh, 250,000 years. And uh, basically what it does is it reveals 
costs that we did not previously have to pay because we were dying for other reasons. We used to die for inf from infectious disease and from childbirth and things like that, and that's mostly been eliminated. And now we live long enough to uh, see what happens when you go on the buy now, pay later plan in biology. <laughs> okay, Framingham Heart Study. This is the gold standard of uh, multi-cohort medical studies. It was started in Framingham in 1948, and it enrolled people who had been born as early as 1890. It has three cohorts that are being followed, and they total about 14,500 people. Uh, they have been given exams every two years for the original cohort, and then about every four years for the offspring cohort, and the third generation cohort has actually now had its second exam, it just it had one by the time uh, we got the, the initial data. So we measured selection intensity as the correlation of the trait with lifetime reproductive success, or family size. And here is an important point. Um, Herbert Spencer coined this uh, motto in the 19th century that evolution was about the survival of the fittest. But it's not. It's about the increased representation of the reproductively successful. And survival is only important to the extent that it contributes to reproduction, which gets genes into the next generation. Now, when I get near the end of the talk and you see how selection intensities have changed on the human population through the demographic transition, you'll see that the mortality selection has fallen very close to zero. But fertility selection remains strong. And here's the illustration of it. Would everyone in the room who comes from a family of one please raise their hand? Only children. Two. Look around. Three. Look around. Four. Look around. Five and more. Okay. There is a lot of variation in reproductive success in contemporary human populations, and that is what is driving contemporary selection. Okay? And uh, the evidence is irrefutable. <laughs> okay, we measured the potential to respond to selection by estimating genetic variation and covariation from pedigrees, and then we projected the responses. A lot of this work was done by Sean Byers. He uh, grew up on a farm in New Zealand and got trained in Melbourne and came to me as a postdoc, and he's now back in Melbourne working on cardiovascular disease. So there are some issues with this kind of data. Here is on the x-axis, we go from 1890 out to about 1960. And on the y-axis, we have lifetime reproductive success. So this is completed family size. And the dots are the averages, and the bars are the standard deviations. And basically, we decided that we were going to represent fitness as the deviation of an individual from the average for a period of time. And the, the lines mark the period of time. This is the baby boom. It's where the boomers came from. This is the baby crash. Okay. This is what happened as we entered the 20th century and went through the First World War. So when you're dealing with that kind of demographic history, you have to make some adjustments to try to estimate what might be a reasonable relative fitness, and that's how we did it. And then there's this issue of the traits, okay? So this looks kind of complicated, but basically we've got women over here and men over here. And on this axis, we have how old they are, okay? On this axis, we have what year were they measured in, what you can see, if you just look at the age axis, for example, this, uh, and, and over here we have total cholesterol. So this is a, these are both measures of total cholesterol. And it, you can see that if you measure men, that their cholesterol tends to go up as they get older, and then it goes down. And with women, it's even more dramatic. And the question is, how are you going to estimate, if you want one sample, uh, what that person's total cholesterol is? So we estimated the surface for the whole population. And uh, for women, we had nearly 45,000 measures, and for men, we had about 37,000. These dots here are repeated measures for one individual. Okay, so that's one individual there. This is another individual over here, similarly. And we took their average distance from the surface as their relative cholesterol measure. So some of them would be above, some of them would be below. 
And that averaged out their tendency for their lifetime and for their period of history as well. Okay, so these are the traits we looked at. We looked at total cholesterol, height and weight, blood pressure, blood glucose, age of first birth, menopause, and death. Now, the Framingham study was set up to look at risk factors for heart disease, and that's why they were so careful to look at cholesterol, height and weight, and blood pressure. And the Framingham study gave us two things that are very, very important worldwide for health. One is cholesterol is a risk factor for heart disease and other things, and the other is that smoking is a risk factor for all kinds of stuff. That came from Framingham. And the people of Framingham who still participate in this program are very proud of the fact that that's something they gave to the world. And they learned from it, and that actually changed the selection pressures. So I'll talk about that a little bit later. These are the selection gradients in the, heart, in the Framingham Heart Study. This is a bunch of numbers, so let me just take a minute to parse them for you. So here, here are the traits, total cholesterol, height, weight, and so forth, going down this column. These are the sample sizes, so we couldn't use everybody for various reasons, but the sample sizes were pretty good. This beta here is the selection gradient. Okay, so that shows you, if it's negative, it means that selection is pushing, in this case, cholesterol downward. If it's positive, as it is in this case, it's pushing weight upward. And then these are the statistical p-values. And this is in a, uh, for those of you who are into statistics, this is in the general linear model. This is like a multiple regression where lots of other factors are taken account of before these estimates are made. Similarly for the men, sample size, selection gradient, p-value. So if you look at that, basically it's saying that for this population, and this is mostly people born between 1900 and 1940, it's not everybody, uh, selection is acting to decrease total cholesterol, to decrease height, to increase weight, to decrease blood pressure, this is systolic blood pressure, to decrease blood glucose, to decrease age at first birth, to increase age at menopause, and for women, no selection on age at death. For men, selection for them to die younger, okay? And selection for men also to have their first child earlier, which isn't surprising because people tend to marry people of similar age. Otherwise, the selection wasn't so significant on men. I'm gonna take that apart in a minute. Okay, so at this level, it doesn't look so significant. Now, my dear friend and chief publicity and press advisor is in the audience. She is my wife. And when this hit the, hit the press, and it said, hey, women are getting shorter and they're getting heavier, she said, don't say fat. <laughs> say pleasingly plump. Now, uh, I'll get, uh, in a minute, I'll get to why we think that's happening, okay? Then, to see whether or not we could expect a response to selection, we needed information on genetic variation, because without genetic response, there is no real evolution. Genetic variation is the fuel that runs the engine of evolution. So we used quantitative genetic techniques. For those of you who are into it, we used the animal model to estimate genetic components on seven traits in 2,655 males and a bit over 2,200 females. They were in 1,538 families. That gave us a fair amount of statistical power for this kind of thing. We stuck in a random effect for maternal ID. Okay, that was more or less to take care of anything like the difference between Italian and Irish cooking. That was significant in about 11%, excuse me, 11% of the analyses. And then we also controlled for smoking, education level, and country of origin. And that was, those were significant in about 3% of the analyses. But whether they were significant or not, we controlled for them. Um, since I'm at Harvard, I have to tell you that natural selection was operating to decrease education level in Framingham. Basically, all that says is that women that had less education had more kids. Okay, so these are the projected responses to selection for women and men. So if you go out about 10 generations, 
what these numbers mean is that you would expect total cholesterol to go from 223.9 to 215.9, okay, so it's going to decrease. It's about a 3.6% change. And there's a lot of numbers here, and I'm going to summarize the main points in a little bit. But we translate those into Haldanes, and that means this is an estimate of how many standard deviations this trait is changing per generation. And we do that so we can compare it with other species. This is for men down here, uh, and you can see that basically the take-home point on this, if you look down at these numbers, is that, oh, evolution is continuing, but it looks like it's going to be kind of slow. Okay? There's nothing astonishingly fast about these numbers. So uh, the rates of projected evolution in Haldanes range from about 0.03 for height in women to less than 0.001 for glucose in men. Okay. That's slower than Galapagos finches. It's slower than Trinidadian guppies, but it's about like New Zealand Chinook salmon or Hawaiian mosquito fish. <laughs> and if you take rates of evolution here, and then this is over how long a period the study went, this is a summary from 1999 of all of the studies of rates of evolution. There are a whole bunch of Hawaiian mosquito fish in here, which I like because I got those estimates myself. This is where the people are. Okay. They're right in the middle. People are evolving at kind of the lower end of the natural range of other plants and animals. At least that's what they're projected to do. Remember I said we didn't have a response to selection. We were just projecting what we think would happen if things kept going like they are. Okay, so now a little bit about secular change. Culture is really important. And the one trait that was consistently under selection was age at first birth in women. And it was to reduce it. Now, this is for the period, this is for the birth dates between 1892 and 1913. This is up through the middle of the Depression. This is from the Depression through the middle of the 50s. Very similar negative selection to reduce age at first birth. And uh, I've often been asked, how can that possibly be? Because most of the women who are asking me that are well-educated, ambitious women from two career families who have delayed having their first child until they're 35. And how is it that selection could be operating in the other direction? Well, this is first, this is the whole population. It's not just all the two career families. And it is showing you that throughout this period in Framingham, there were women who had more children in their lifetime because they began sooner. Okay. However, what it's doing is it is changing the biological structure of the population. Layered on top of that is cultural evolution, which is saying, no, wait, delay the kid. Have a happy career. Get your PhD, right? And then have your children. And what that's doing is it's increasing the tension between biology and culture. And so if you in your heart of hearts feel like you are being torn, you really are. <laughs> biology is pushing one way and culture is pushing another. So why is this happening? Well, I was involved in a piece of life history theory about 25 years ago that connects this shift in selection to the demographic transition. And let me walk you through this slide a bit. This is a, a slide from a paper in 1986. And it was the first prediction of what the optimal reaction norm for age and size of maturity should be. So this is size on the y-axis. This is age on the x-axis. These dotted lines are growth curves. Okay? And there are various forces that would say, well, it would be better to mature earlier. You could have a shorter generation time. You'd have less risk of getting killed before you had your first kid. There are other forces which are saying, oh, you want to mature later. Because if you're la you mature later, you are bigger. You're more physiologically competent. You can have more offspring. And this line shows where the balance between those forces is. Okay? So it's sort of the best compromise you can make. And what it says is, 
for this particular set of assumptions. If you're growing fast, mature young and big. And if you're growing slow, mature old and small. Okay? That's what the optimal reaction norm prediction is. Well, we have fairly good data on the difference in ages at maturity of women in England and Scotland in the 19th century and women living on farms in the US in the 20th century with similar genetic backgrounds. These women were stressed. They were working in the Industrial Revolution. And uh, as Peter and his colleagues will tell you, stress has a big impact on female reproduction. They were growing more slowly, and they matured later. The women who were living on farms in the United States in the 1930s and 40s were growing faster. They were bigger at a given age, and they matured younger. The difference was about somewhere between five and six years. And if we put in these effects into that model, it predicts just about that change. Now, you'll see that there are two lines here. Okay, One of them is lower than the other and shifts, thing over, shifts over to the left a little bit. This is what we predicted 25 years ago, 28 years ago, if infant mortality rates remained low because of modern medicine. So we have clean water, hygiene, vaccines, antibiotics, and better health care. And as a result of that, infant mortality rates from infectious disease have dropped. What that means, basically, is that you can get away with having a kid earlier. You don't have to have it in such great shape because we've removed a lot of the threats. And that would shift the whole curve down and to the left. In other words, it predicts that when you go through the demographic transition and the Industrial Revolution, women will be selected to be smaller and to have their first child earlier. Exactly what we saw in Framingham. This is, by the way, a useful way of looking at the world because it shows you that this change here along this axis, that's nurture. Okay, that's the effect of less stress and better food. This shift here, that's genetic, that's nature, that's shifting the whole curve. So you should think of evolution as designing a flexible rule of thumb to deal with a wide range of environmental conditions. And it allows you to think, I think, in a much more nuanced way about the whole nature-nurture question. That's, that's a broader issue than what I'm talking about today, but this is a useful tool. OK, so what is actually the cost of earlier age at first birth? Okay, they are, as I've mentioned, the age and size of maturation are determined by trade-offs, by costs and benefits on either side of the picture. And it's offspring of younger first-time mothers who are suffering higher mortality rates. So these are the infant mortality rates per thousand for all the births in the United States in 1960 and 1961. And these are the ages of the mothers who were giving birth for the first time. Okay. This is very probably a point that's determined almost entirely by rape within families, because these are eight-year-old girls. And they have very high mortality rates in their offspring. It drops off real fast. It seems to hit a nice low point around 18 to 28. That would be the peak time to start having babies biologically. And then, as you all know, the biological clock starts ticking. Interesting things happen to the maintenance of the female germline. And the probability that a child will die if the mother is older starts to go up. So what happened in the demographic transition is this whole curve got shifted down to the left. And it made it cheaper to have a child earlier. And that is what shifted that optimal age at first, first birth down, uh, down towards, oh, in the neighborhood of 20 or 18 or something like that. So what's going on here is that culture is influencing demographic rates. It's influencing fertility and mortality. But that is what is driving selection. And in this case, they reduced the evolutionary cost of earlier maturation. But the benefits remained the same. And that's why women were selected to, to 
mature earlier. Okay, so first summary. Women in Framingham, between, born between 1900 and 1940, were predicted to evolve to become shorter and plumper with lower values for total cholesterol and systolic blood pressure and to reach for first birth earlier and menopause later. That, by the way, this is an interesting observation. They're getting their first child earlier. They could have their last child later. Selection has shifted from being driven primarily by mortality to being driven pri primarily by fertility. And the window for having children is getting longer. In other words, you concentrate on fertility, you get more opportunities to have babies. Males were also predicted to father their first child earlier and to die earlier. We'll come back to that point. Selection in these populations is driven mostly by variation in fertility. It's broadening the fertility window. And these are modest, gradual evolutionary changes. Nothing is happening too fast. Now, during the 20th century, selection decreased in intensity. Okay, it didn't change direction, but it decreased in intensity. It actually, we can't detect any more significant selection on blood pressure and cholesterol operating in the 1980s, 1990s, and this millennium. That's because it was the Framingham study that showed that cholesterol and smoking are bad for your health. And like everybody else in the world, the people of Framingham adopted a healthier lifestyle. They cut their smoking. They started jogging. We can actually see a blip in body mass index in 1977 when everybody starts jogging. And that cultural feedback, right, the Framingham study is culture. It's medical culture. Put information out, culturally transmitted, that caused people to change their lifestyles in ways that changed natural selection on their biology. I think that's probably the biggest take home message of the Framingham study is that culture has become the most important selective agent acting on further human evolution and the primary driver is medicine. Changes in medical practice and public health. Okay, so culture has not stopped evolution in humans, instead become the major factor. So medicine and public health are playing the leading role. That was our first message. However, when we did that initial study, we didn't really yet have our hands adequately on the issue of, of the following important fact. Every autosomal gene in your body, that means everyone that's not on a Y chromosome, it would include the X chromosome, spends half its time in males and half its time in females. That means that if you look at it from the point of view of the gene, it's got to be able to function to make babies both when it's sitting in a male and when it's sitting in a female. Well, that constrains things because it's got to try to do two things rather than just one. So the traits that these genes influence also experience different selection pressures in the two sexes. So selection might be acting one way on height in males and another way on height in females, for example. So this fact means that there are genetic correlations between the sexes, and they are going to be interacting with sexually conflicting selection pressures, and that will generate constraints on response. So the question is, did it happen in Framingham? Well, here are the Framingham pedigrees. So blue is a connection from a father to a child. Red is from a mother to a child. Gray means they're not in the correlation analysis for one reason or another. And I give that to you just to show you the depth of the number of generations and the amount of data that went into the following numbers. OK, there were significant cross-sex correlations. This is kind of a hard table to parse, OK? But Basically, this is the additive uh, genetic variance covariance matrix, the G matrix. And this part over here is just showing you, OK, this is total cholesterol here in a row, and this is total cholesterol in a column. And this number here is the genetic variance for total cholesterol for both men and women. And this would be the, this number going down the diagonal is the genetic variance for weight 
in men and women. This is not heritability, this is genetic variance. Now, the off-diagonal elements are the covariances. So it, this would be, for example, this negative number here between total cholesterol and height means that as height goes up, total cholesterol goes down, genetically. Okay, that's the genetic component of that. So that's a little bit about how to read the numbers. The numbers that are in bold, the dark ones, have a p-value which is less than 0 0.0001. Okay, so they're highly significant. This is for males, excuse me, that's for males, this is for females. This is between the sexes. Now I see the colors didn't come out quite so well here, but basically we call the, correlate, the genetic correlation of total cholesterol in females with total cholesterol in males, the direct correlation, and that these would be the direct correlations between the sexes. But if you see something off the diagonal, that means, for example, that systolic blood pressure has a significant genetic correlation between the sexes with diastolic blood pressure. Systolic blood pressure has a significant correlation between the sexes with glucose. This one means that there's a significant cor genetic correlation between the weight of the female and the height of the male, not necessarily in a marriage. This is in the whole population. In other words, there's the expression of these genes in the different sexes is leading to these genetic correlations. And that means that the evolution of the two sexes is linked together. This is not sexual selection, okay? This is the, all stemming from the fact that all autosomal genes spend half their time in males and half their time in females, and they are involved usually in building similar sorts of traits, but in somewhat different ways. And some of these things are really kind of curious. Um, and one would wonder, why is it that maybe, you know, female height might be correlated with something crazy in, in males and vice versa. And the way I think about it is this. Evolution pr proceeds by tinkering. And a gene will only get selected if it's available in the population. And if it has a net positive effect, it might have some disadvantages, but if it has a net positive effect, it will get selected at the time that it comes in. It doesn't mean it's the best one. It's just whichever ha one happened to occur. And this process starts layering upon layer of genetic interaction until you build a genome that's connected in many different ways. And then we come along, you know, millions of years later and do a study like this, and what we see are some connections between the sexes that look kind of arbitrary, and why did that ever happen? Well, it's a trace of history in the genetic structure of males and females. Ah, all I had to do was click and I would get the colors. I forgot. So these are the direct, these are the indirect, and yes, the answer is yes. There are genetic correlations between males and females, and they are both direct in the same trait, and they are indirect where one trait in a female is affecting another trait in a male. Now, what difference did that make to selection? Well, what we have here. This, is, this may be a little confusing, so I'm going to be, try to be real clear about it. In this graph, black is females and white is males. These are selection intensities, so this would be positive, this would be negative. The asterisks tell you how significant it is. The more asterisks, the more highly significant it is. For example, take a look at selection on height. Okay, Black is females. Selection is very strong in females to decrease height and very weak in males and not significant at all. That's what the difference between those two bars means. And if you look across that, you can get an overall picture showing you that selection is not only different on different traits, but it differs by sex as you go across the traits. Okay. Now, now we change the meaning of black and white. Black now means you've got the genetic correlations I showed you between the sexes in there, and white means we pulled them out artificially, okay? And we then wanted to project what would be the response to selection with and without the genetic linkage between the sexes. 
So if you see a difference between the black and the white bar, what this one is saying, this is for total cholesterol, okay, and this is in males, and it's saying that almost all of the selection on total cholesterol in males is coming through its genetic correlations with females. And if you take that out, there's almost no selection on total cholesterol in males. And if you look across that for males and females, you can see that the response to selection that you expect depends critically on the degree of linkage with the other sex. Okay? So that is the little mental exercise we carried out to try to, to dissect out this genetic connection between the two sexes. So selection on males is constraining responses in females and vice versa, and it happens both because selection intensities differ between the two sexes and because traits are genetically correlated across the two sexes. And that gives us, you know, I would advise you not to use it in family argument, <laughs> but it's an interesting observation about our nature. And it leads me to a modest suggestion. So do a mental experiment. So substitute genes for mate preference for genes for total cholesterol and blood pressure. We don't, we don't know what they are. We don't even know if they exist. But let us suppose that they might exist. Would a similar effect explain the evolution of homosexuality? I think it might. Okay. So this, other people have tried to uh, analyze this. There's a paper by a group of Italians, Chiani and, and some others. Uh, there are other evolutionary alternatives, but the existence of homosexuality, where people are, at least before modern reproductive medicine, they were deciding that they weren't going to reproduce, that was a very puzzling evolutionary problem. And I think that if we see that the two sexes are really linked together like this, you can begin to see that maybe it's a spillover effect from the other sex. Of course, it's also modulated by lots of other things like having older brothers and stuff like that. So it's not, it's not genetically straightforwardly determined by any means. Now, to my, back to my life history roots, are there costs of reproduction in humans? So this is an important idea because if there is a trade-off between reproduction and survival, as posited by George Williams back in the 1950s, that would be a key reason for the evolution of aging and also for the evolution of the whole reproductive schedule while one is still alive. That's been detected experimentally in flies and worms. I did some of the work on flies. Lots of people did it. And some of the genes there are known. And previous work on people has demonstrated some phenotypic trade-offs, okay, but without really getting at the genetic basis of them. So the people involved in this study, it was this time it was mostly Susan Wong, who was a wonderful uh, grad student in stats at Yale, and she's decided she wants to teach in a liberal arts college and is starting in Amherst in the fall. And Sean Byers, who was involved in the other part of the Framingham study, kind of guided Susan through the complexities of the Framingham data set. They are so complex that for this study, downloading the genomic data took a week. It was 756 gigabytes. Um, and if Susan did one run, even on a fast computer, it would often take uh, hours or days. So there were phenotypic costs of reproduction. So if you just took the people who had already died in Framingham, there were 680 women who had already died, the phenotypic correlation of their reproductive success, which is called, and the dem demographers call it children ever born, by lifespan was negative. That was highly significant. And each additional child cost about three quarters of a year of life. Now, actually what was going on is that it was good to have the first one and the second one so that your lifespan actually increased, your mortality decreased if you had one or two kids. But three, four, five, six, seven, it just started climbing like that, which won't surprise parents getting up late at night. Right? <laughs> David can go on about that later if he wants. <laughs> so uh, in a larger sample where we allowed for right censoring, which you can do with these kinds of sample sizes and using something which is called Cox regression, uh, increases in family size were significantly related to increases in risk of death from heart attack, stroke, and cancer in both women and men. 
in Framingham. So we had not only the general pattern, we had some indications of the kinds of mechanisms that might be in play. Did they have a genetic basis? So we looked at genetic correlations from a lot of pedigrees. You saw the pedigree study. There is a whopping huge negative genetic correlation between number of children per lifetime and age at death in women, highly significant. And there is a significant genetic correlation between the number of children and age at menarche. In other words, if you increase age at menarche, uh, which actually is decreasing the, the reproductive window, there was a genetic effect on it. Okay, this is not phenotype, this is genetic effect. So these things are controlled for stuff like smoking and education and so forth, like the other estimates were. So we then use the genetic data available in Framingham to look across the entire genome. We have, uh, we have genetic data on about 9,500 people in Framingham. And we were looking for chromosomal regions that had little markers planted on them, like little flags, okay? And we could see whether they had a, a red flag or a green flag, basically. And that would associate that chunk of genome with an effect that we could measure. One of those markers was close to robust to changes in the model. Now, I'm, what I'm doing here is I'm hedging because this whole aspect of modern genomic science is fraught with statistical difficulty. And you can change the assumptions of the models and effect will go away and they'll come back. We tried many different ways of doing this estimate and it was really quite robust, okay? So this region of the genome is near a gene called Eomis, which is a master regulator gene. It's implicated in bladder cancer and in multiple sclerosis. Now, if you were looking, if you were just a priori looking for things that cause trade-offs between traits, it would make sense to concentrate on genes that controlled entire genetic networks because they're controlling lots of interactions, one of which might hit one trait and another of which might hit another trait. Okay, so maybe it's not surprising that the strongest signal we got was from a master regulator. However, when we put in major causes of mortality, whether they're smokers, their total cholesterol, stuff like that, that marker dropped below the significance threshold if you're doing 440,000 statistical tests. Okay, so this is a conservative way of doing it that probably misses some significant signals, and we think that we have a signal here which is interesting and deserves further exploration. There was another one that was almost uh, significant. It's close to a gene that's associated with brain development and with vaccine response. Now, interestingly, and now I'm getting into the demographic transition and degenerative disease, Others have found genes that increase fertility early in life while increasing risk of cancer late in life. P53 is a famous cancer gene. You get a mutation in this in your germline and you get, uh, it's called uh, Lulfrumeni syndrome. I'm, I may not be pronouncing it correctly, but uh, a whole set of childhood cancers. This is a gene that controls both cell cycle and DNA repair and it controls whether or not a cell will listen to a signal to commit suicide if it's got damage in it, okay? So the, first, the worst thing that can happen in a cancer is that a damaged cell will not listen to the immune system and will say, no, I will not commit suicide for the good of the rest of my body. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna make more cells, okay? And that's what starts a cancer off. Often that is because of a mutation in the P53 gene. Well, that allele that raises that risk helps the embryo to implant into the endometrium right at the start of life. That's an incredible trade-off. I mean, that's about as early as you can go in life. So this is a trade-off between something very early and then a risk much later. The, the evidence for that, I think, is a little bit better than the evidence for the early onset breast cancer gene but there are interesting correlations. The alleles in the early onset breast cancer gene that raise the risk of breast cancer in younger women also increase the number of children, reduce birth intervals, and extend the period of childbearing. So if you're scratching your head and you're wondering, why in the heck do we have mutations floating around in our population that put us at risk of getting cancer, 
it looks like maybe we're starting to get some <coughs> insight into that. Okay? Maybe in the past, when cancer was unlikely to be the cause of death, these things were actually increasing reproductive success. So, into the demographic transition. Prior to the demographic transition, and it, it started occurring in France in about 1700, and it's still going on in parts of the developed world, very few people died of cancer or heart disease. So genes that increased fertility at the cost of risking such death had low costs or no cost. When we shift the causes of mortality, with modern hygiene and vaccines. That allows us to live longer, but it then reveals genetic effects that had previously been concealed. So here's a picture of the demographic transition in England. This runs from 1541 over here to 2001 over here. The black line is the total fertility rate. So this point here means that in 1541, the average woman had about 3.3 kids and it fluctuated through history, and then it dropped very suddenly and steeply. That's the demographic transition. And now it's at less than two, so it's at less than replacement in England as it is in most countries of the developed world. These other lines are the selection intensities that are due to the variation in mortality rates and fertility rates among individuals. The Total selection intensity is in yellow, the mortality contribution is in blue, and the fertility contribution is in pink. And the thing I want you to notice is that right about here, right about 1900, the blue and the pink lines cross, and the mortality contribution to this potential contribution to selection goes down and down and just about disappears. And the pink contribution to selection, which is from fertility variation, which is what happened when you guys raised all your hands, stays significant and is not disappearing. So that's a picture of the demographic transition. And it's one of the biggest things that's happened in human populations, really, in our life as a species. So we decided to take a look at it in the Gambia. Peter does some work in the Gambia. And the people who did it were Ian Rickert and Alex Cortiol, uh, and a bunch of us uh, others. They were the, the lead on it. It was kind of a hard study to do because we wanted to get an estimate every year. And so that you know people don't live one year. People live 70 or 80 years. So we had to come up with a method of estimating yearly contributions to fitness and associate them with traits. Okay? So this is the total variance in fitness each year. And look at what happened to early survival, variation in early survival in 1974, 1975. That's when the British medical establishment went into these villages, instituted a program of hygiene and malaria control, and brought infant mortality rates way down. So this was a very sudden demographic transition. And when that happened, the variation in fertility, which had been substantial before, took a little bit of a dip, and then it went up. And the selection on height, total selection on height, looks kind of scattered over there. But if you break it down into its components, you can see that the mortality selection on height is quite different from the fertility selection on height. And when you look at it that way, you come to the conclusion that unlike Framingham, in the Gambia, when that population went through a demographic transition, women got selected to be taller and thinner. And the Daily Mail in London picked that up and said, natural selection for fashion models, okay? Which was, you know, nicer than saying, oh, the women of Framingham are getting plumper and shorter. It's the other way around in the Gambia. And that means that we are just beginning our understanding of what selection pressures are like on contemporary human populations. It depends a lot on whether they're in a developed country where the patterns are pretty consistent between Framingham and Finland and Australia, or if you are in a quite different country like the Gambia where the sources of mortality are very different. Infectious disease was still quite important. People are suffering from worms. Nutrition is a whole different picture. And that means differences in selection pressure. If we look at what's going on in Utah where we have magnificent data that Jake Morad 
has analyzed. And we look from 1830 through 1890, we see that the selection being caused by survival or variation in mortality rates is dropping, and the selection being caused by variation in reproductive rates is rising. So this is actually a very similar picture to what we saw with that picture from England and the exercise that I led you through with respect to Framingham. Variation in fertility is now really driving modern human evolution in developed countries. So my conclusions are that we're still evolving. We have documented an episode of intense selection that later eased off because of cultural evolution. And I think that change is very interesting. Women in Framingham are under selection to have their first child earlier in life, also in Finland, also in Australia. That amplifies an already developing conflict between biology and culture. So that one kind of grabs us in the gut. Selection in each sex is constraining responses in the other sex. That might explain some of the paradoxes of human sexuality, and it certainly explains some of our imperfections. We are as Shakespeare noted, rather imperfect. There are genetically based costs of reproduction in humans, and some of the genes have been identified and deserve a bit more uh, examination. And I think the take home there is that uh, if you are thinking in a science fiction fashion about uh, the long-term consequences of germline therapy in humans to get rid of cancer, you'd better know what, those can what other things those cancer genes are doing because there is no such thing as a cancer gene. There's no gene that is ever selected for cancer, right? It's the dysregulation of a normal gene that has other functions. In this case, improving reproductive success. The demographic transition is a major recent shift in selection. It uncovered costs that previously did not have to be paid, at least not to the current extent. And those costs now burden our aging population and are causing the costs of health care to skyrocket all over the developed world. Thank you. So Jane told me we're going to break up by 7.15. We have time for questions, and I'll be happy to field them myself. So just raise your hand if you want to ask something. In the back, yeah. I can't hear that. Could you speak up? Jane, do we have a mic? Or can you walk down here and ask me? I'm wearing hearing aids, and when people go out the door and they rustle, it covers up your voice. Oh, do I think that Fitbits and other things that people wear will affect evolution? Well, you know, to the extent that it's going to have a marginal impact on mortality from things like heart disease and cancer, then it probably will have something. But I think more realistically, a big impact on evolution comes from NSAIDs. So people who are taking statins, naproxen, and aspirin are lowering the inflammatory level of their entire body, and they are reducing the risk not only of heart disease, but of cancer and Alzheimer's. So I think those are probably also going to be changing mortality patterns and therefore selection pressures. But they do so mostly in older people, so it's kind of a weak effect. It's things that happen to young people that have a big impact on gene frequencies. How will obesity in the young population affect evolution? Well, uh, obesity in the young population has an impact on reproductive success. And uh, kids who are obese are likely to have fewer children for a variety of reasons, some of them having to do with disease, um, some with behavior. Uh, being a little bit overweight is good for your reproduction. But being a lot overweight is very bad for your reproduction, so it's complicated. It's not, it's not a linear relationship by any means. But uh, I think that 
what you're getting at is a cultural trend that popped up pretty quickly, right? And was noticed and which is now being combated by Michelle Obama and lots of other people, which is having some effect. And I, I think the take home on that is that culture is really hard to predict. And evolution is slow and culture is fast. And culture can be doing this and evolution is running to keep up, but it's tracking a moving target that's changing all the time. And so I think that we're probably always going to be locked into this tortoise and the hare kind of race, where biology is the tortoise and culture is the hare, and the hare is fickle and it changes direction a lot. Back there. Well, like a lot of things in these studies, one has to be careful about quantifying risk, okay? You can get statistical significant associations on small effects. So I've just done this in another study for autism and schizophrenia in Denmark. And I can show you that if you have a child who is very heavy, so maybe a nine or 10 pounder, that they are at an increased risk of autism. But the absolute risk is 0.65%, and when you add in that extra risk, it becomes 1%. So it's still a one in 100 chance. So one has to be careful about thinking quantitatively when we say things like that. And it's just like that for implantation in the P53 gene. But in that case, I don't have the numbers in my head to quote to you. But the effect is significant but small. It does, and what basically you're calling attention to is the very important role of culture in starting to change selection pressures on humans. And it, it's a bit complicated. So for example, if a woman decides at the age of 22 to freeze some eggs because she's not planning to have her first child until she's 38 and she doesn't want to have trisomy or something like that, how does evolution, how does you know, the, the, the blind judge of selection look at her age of maturity? Is it 22 or is it 38? Well, genetically, it's 22. Demographically, it's 38. We probably have to keep track both ways if we want to really understand the consequences. Um, I have a colleague who is a reproductive uh, doctor who does in vitro fertilizations and who was very interested in the question of whether or not IVF babies would be more likely to have genetic defects because they wouldn't have passed through the marvelous screening procedure that the natural female reproductive tract has which is a very impressive screen and produces you know, pretty high quality babies. It makes some mistakes more as it gets older, but it's a very impressive screen. And Roger Gosden was not able to find very much effect uh, in in vitro fertilization. But we have to remember that the way in vitro fertilization works is you harvest a bunch of eggs and you put them in a Petri dish and you inseminate them with a sperm. And then you get a lot more than you implant and they check to see which ones are developing properly before they implant them and then they always implant extras and they often fail. So there is a selection step there as well. So the fact that Roger wasn't getting a big bump in genetic defects in IVF babies is at least partially accounted for by the fact that there's still a selection filter in IVF.
ingredients. Uh, people are not using the, not walking as much as they were in the past, and not communicating with other humans. Like, what is the impact of Facebook and Twitter yeah. on natural selection? <laughs> Well, I, as Yogi Berra said, prediction is very difficult, especially about the future, right? But, uh, <laughs> but we do know this about technology and human reproduction. Prior to the introduction of the bicycle, the average, a, the average distance between the birthplaces of a husband and a wife was on the order of one to five miles. It was how far you could walk. The introduction of the bicycle bumped it up to 10 to 20 miles. The introduction of the train bumped it up even further. My son is married to a woman whose father was born on Mount Kilimanjaro. He was born in San Francisco. And that's going to happen more and more. So one of the things that technology is doing and globalization is doing is it's causing the merging of the total human gene pool. It's going to take a while. There are all kinds of cultural traditions that are going to push against it and whatnot. I got quoted once on this issue by saying, oh, in the future, we're all going to look like Brazilians. And I got a call from a Brazilian journalist who said, hey, I'm looking out at the street, and everybody looks different. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's not necessarily unexpected. There's this phenomenon when you make a genetic cross that you get an F2, the second, the grandchildren, have tremendous variation. But one of the impacts of technology is going to be that we're all going to look more alike a thousand years from now than we do now. And that will have various consequences. One of them will be that we'll probably have more resistance genes, and I'll bet the record in the 100-yard dash goes down. Ah, well, I'm not sure that it does, because it makes an assumption that there are genes for mate choice, OK? But the idea would be that women are being selected to choose men who have certain characteristics. And men are being selected to choose women who have certain characteristics. And that when the genes for mate selection in women get expressed in men, sometimes it's not perfect. And the men then are selecting men who have the characteristics that had been selected in the women. Got it? <laughs> so would you like to go out to dinner? <laughs> In, increase the risk of cancer later, yeah. Uh, would, on average, if women lived health, you know, health-wise, optimal lives, health-wise, like, you know, they eat only whole grains, maybe very little meat and vegetables. They Kale for breakfast, yeah. Do <laughs> <laughs> you think that would reduce the risk in your opinion? Oh, sure. There are strong environment, genetic, gene-by-environment interactions in all of these things. So normally, the risk goes way up when you're doing bad things environmentally and you got bad genes. It doesn't mean you'll always get cancer, but the risks will go up. But if you have bad genes and you do good things environmentally, you definitely will have lower risk. There's no question about it. You know that curve when you showed that older women have more mortality in their uh, strength? How much of that is due to older males that they met their, their partners? That's very interesting. Now, the question is, how much of the increase in uh, infant mortality in older women is due to the fact that those women are having children by older males? 90% of the mutations in the human germline have come in through older males. And that's because of the profound difference in the biology of eggs and sperm. Sperm have gone through many more cell divisions by the time an older male uses one. And each cell division is an opportunity to pick up a mutation. Jim Crow did a really nice analysis of that. So, my answer to that is that I think that's part of it. And I think the other part of it is this wonderful quality control screen that is the human female reproductive tract also ages. It gets leakier as it gets older. It's not as precise in picking up the trisomies and the biochemical defects and stuff like that. So it gets leakier, but also, you know, but I, uh, I remember I had, a, uh, I had a graduate student in Switzerland a woman who was a behavioral ecologist. And you know, I pointed out this observation about older men having defective sperm. 
and younger men having healthier ones. And she said, oh, women have known that for a long time. That's why we marry the old ones and we have the babies with the young ones. Well, I, the way I see it, Michael, is that uh, there was selection for fertility before the transition, and it didn't result in cancers because people died of infectious disease and in childbirth and things like that. So the costs were low, and there was some benefit. There were lots of other things that selected for fertility, and these genes were not at, you know, it's not like everybody had them. They're at fairly low, they're, at, they're not at strikingly high frequency in the population. But if cancer was the main thing that they did, they are at surprisingly high frequency. There is a paradox to be explained, a quantitative paradox to be explained. So yeah, I think that uh, I doubt that we are any longer selecting for them, okay? Uh, just the whole impact of modern medicine and breast cancer screening and all kinds of things leads me to believe that we probably aren't but I can't prove that. And one of the things that I've learned in science is that as we get older, we all want to be able to come so, to some kind of profound conclusion about something, but in fact, the data won't let us, let us do it yet. <laughs> and so we have to learn to be kind of firm in our agnosticism. So my answer to you is that on that point, I'm agnostic. Okay, that's it. <laughs>